After Frank Whittle built his first prototype jet engine, the British Air Ministry, now mildly interested in the idea, offered Vauxhall, British Thompson Houston and Rover a development contract working with Whittle. Rover took the contract in the absence of any interest from the other two and so began a short, painful relationship between Rover and Whittle. Rover very quickly swapped their jet development factory with Rolls-Royce for a tank engine factory and busied themselves with other projects until after the war. Technology had made massive improvements in design and construction and most involved with gas turbines were intent on producing fighter jet engines. Rover however looked at their existing research and thought it might make good advertising uh, if they pop one in a car. There were many industrial concerns looking at utilising this new engine in trucks, trains, buses and aeroplanes, but nearly all other parties did so in conjunction with aero engine manufacturers, with the obvious pressure to use expensive parts and technology common to aircraft power plants. While Rover, a mere fly spec of a company when compared with de Havilland, Rolls-Royce or Allison, muddled on with a couple of technicians they'd poached from Rolls-Royce and cost always being a dictating factor. Let's just quickly look at what theoretical differences there are between a high altitude turbojet and a turbo shaft for a car. Fuel consumption, unit cost, noise and the ability to run at low power settings efficiently were all very important to Rover, but for a fighter aircraft they were secondary considerations. After power to weight and altitude performance. A fighter, bomber or transport will achieve its best performance at very high altitudes. Not because the engine runs better up there, but because the airframe experiences less drag. And in order to compensate the engine for the rarefied atmosphere it is now operating in, the freest possible flow must be obtained in order to benefit from the aircraft's forward speed known as the ram effect. Which is of no use whatsoever to a car travelling under 100 mile an hour. So after a few years tinkering and a bit of government funding, Rover unfailed its Jet 1, which basically consisted of a Rover P4, front mounted petrol engine removed and a gas turbine where the back sheets had been. All beautifully streamlined with no roof and speed screens fitted. The Jet 1's gas turbine was similar to the original development engine with a centrifugal compressor and high pressure turbine mounted back to back with a single offset combustion chamber but differed by having a power recovery turbine on a second shaft of axial flow type often referred to these days as a free turbine. Having a free turbine on a car meant that it required no clutch and the relatively wide operating range meant that only one gear was required. Jet 1 set a turbine land speed record and won a prize for an endurance challenge. After the success of Jet 1, Rover saw a niche in the market and offered a development of this engine for industrial and aircraft auxiliary use in two power outputs, the 2S100 and 2S150. They also at this point decided rather than go big, they would go small and took the free turbine out of the engine, simply gearing the main compressor turbine shaft producing the 1S60, which is almost certainly the smallest commercially successful turboshaft engine ever produced. Experiments had been conducted with this engine in light aircraft. I am unfortunately not able to find any further details on these trials. The tiny turbine saw most of its success with the Royal Navy, who bought them as man-portable pump units. They were hand cranked for starting and drove large centrifugal pumps which could be carried by two men and either used for firefighting or pumping out flooded compartments of a ship. With a weight comparable to a 5 horsepower diesel engine but an output of 60 horsepower, the benefits of its power to weight in this situation is immediately visible. 
Service in this role continued from the 60s through to the 80s. Following sporadic interest and the installation of turbines to subsequent Rover models as one-off marketing cars and the Rover BRM Le Mans car, Rover experienced financial difficulties in the late 60s and was bought by Leyland, who, wanting Rover to focus on cars, were happy for Lucas to take on production of the airborne units, which they did with great success, going on to produce APUs for the Harrier in significant numbers and also producing the CT3201, a pure jet version for use in a Belgium drone. Leyland, however, having seen the experiments conducted in America with Ford's Big Red and GMC's Titan II and several buses, decided they should carry out similar experiments and fitted a 150 horsepower 2S150 engine to a lorry. Realising they would need something much bigger, they enlarged the core and produced a new cast iron housing for the engine, conceivably being the only ever full cast iron gas turbine ever built. Unlike the Jet one car and later Rover BRM Le Mans car, a lorry definitely needs a reverse gear. So the now 350 horsepower cast iron gas turbine drove a 5 speed box with hub reduction and reverse. The engine along with a few previous automotive units, featured a ceramic heat exchange, which consisted of a honeycomb disc into which hot exhaust was blown on one half and compressor air blown on the other half before entering the combustion chamber. The disc rotated at 60 RPM with the effect that the pre-combustion air was heated and the exhaust cooled. This increased the pressure at combustion, greatly improving the efficiency of the engine, while also reducing heat of the exhaust and slightly dampening the constant high-pitched whine. The project was backed by Shell, Esso and Castrol. During the late 60s, maintenance of lorry fleets was the biggest cost following the initial purchase, with fuel being a distant third. So the promise of a massively reduced maintenance and longer time between overhauls at the expense of poor urban fuel consumption made a lot of sense especially for the fuel companies investing in the project, who would benefit from increased fuel consumption. Unfortunately, the oil crisis of the early 70s saw a five-fold rise in the cost of fuel, instantly making the turbine lorry a most unattractive idea. The 350 horsepower cast iron turbine did see further use, however, in British Rail's APTE, Advanced Passenger Train Experiment, which saw sleek aluminium trains with two power cars, each power car containing five of these engines, four for tractor power and one for powering the train's environmental systems. Having set a new British Railway speed record of 152 miles per hour in 1975, the project was abandoned in favour of an all-electric solution. Infrastructure problems also saw this project abandoned, with the tilting train technology being gifted to the Italians and the electric class 91 used on electrified lines while the HS125 which had already started production in 1975 continues in service today powered by two lovely great big Paxman Valenta 2500 horsepower 79 litre V12 diesels and so ends the story of Rover's gas turbines while the prospect of 10 turbines per train is pretty cool I also like really big diesels Maybe let me know how you feel about this in the comments and I'll try and steer the channel in that direction. But it does seem to have a mind of its own at the minute. Thank you very much for watching Turbo Productions today. I hope you have enjoyed this episode and will do me a massive favour by liking this video, sharing and subscribing if you have not done so already. I have another channel, Turbo Conquering Mega Eagle of which I make things with my own hands. And you can support my activities on YouTube by becoming a patron. Link in the description below. Thank you again, and until next time, goodbye.